thank you for the invitation also. Nice that so many people are joining in. Um, let's see how I get to the next slide. Uh, oh, that's over here. <clears throat> I, um, I want to share some of the Dutch experiences in uh, protecting urban areas. Um, I suppose I have been invited also because the Netherlands has a long tradition in protection against floods, uh, even with climate change, as the climate changes all the time. But the main problem is that it's now changing very fast and we should be prepared for that. And um, we also have some experience with innovations in, in, in approaches to deal with these kind of risks. So I also wanted to share some of the experience uh, for that. Um, the question is, of course, why should you bother? I mean, um, there might be countries that don't have that much problems or don't face that many risks. But at least for the Netherlands, as being a very, very vulnerable area, uh, I will show you later on how vulnerable, but we are a low-lying delta and we have to be prepared and should bother about the effects of climate change to protect our areas. And um, it, it, it mainly focuses on, on how can we achieve a sustainable land use, sustainable water use, how will we deal with our energy supply, with our transport, with the use of natural resources. And except from floods, we are now facing a whole new problem. That is uh, a lack of fresh water during uh, hot summers. Uh, that is quite new. It's, it's familiar for the southern part of Europe, but for us, it's, it's, it's a really new topic and we have to deal with it. And as this is a multidisciplinary audience uh, with uh, people from different backgrounds, I thought it is also good to show why, why should lawyers be involved? I mean, most of the time they only cause trouble by focusing on what is not possible. Um, but it's also good to, to show that we bring in some valuable elements uh, when you tackle these kind of societal problems. For example, that law provides the institutional framework. Who has power to organize things? Who has the authority to, to act? Um, in what way are the public and private responsibilities divided? Who should take action? Is this a private problem or should governments take action? And if they do so, what kind of policy instruments uh, have been provided for them? And what is also a very typical legal issue, especially when it comes to these kind of problems, is that you need mechanisms for balancing the diversity of interests that are at stake. Um, this is especially in the Netherlands very important as we are a densely populated country, very small, um, and every meter of land is used intensively. So every action you want to take will touch the interests of many people. And there should be mechanisms to balance these interests in a fair way and to take care that the decision making process is not that the rich parties will win or the private parties will win or the developers will always win or the economic interest will always win, but that we also take care of the more weaker or vulnerable interests when we try to find solutions. <clears throat> to, to, to set the scene a bit, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, we have important drivers for dealing with our country and with these kinds of societal challenges, uh, and that's the land use, especially urbanization, but also very intensive agriculture, more and more industrial zones, uh, energy use, which is increasing, use of resources, which is very can make us very vulnerable, and of course, climate change. And um, it means that we face different risks. 
And they are both environmental risk, like uh, focusing on biodiversity or ecosystems, but also societal risks when it comes to climate change. And I think health problems are an important one, but also to take care of the vulnerable population. If we compare it with COVID-19, today the newspapers were full that most of the COVID-19 uh, victims, people get ill and who die, are the poor ones. Uh, so it's, it's important if you want to look at how to, yeah, organize your urban areas and, and, and deal with climate change to have a special focus on the vulnerable population. At least that's my opinion. And if we look at climate change, we see also impacts on both the environment and different sectors. And all sectors should be aware of these impacts. But what we see in the Netherlands is that uh, especially uh, uh, like telecommunication, ICT services, energy services, they are not aware of what can happen when the effects of climate change come, become more uh, severe. Of course, we have the energy mitigation strategies, but the impacts uh, and what, what the sectors can do to deal with the effects is, is, is not clear at all. Uh, so, the idea is that there should, they should be more aware. And if we look at all kinds of solutions that can be developed, then we can see that one could best choose a mix of measures. Very concrete, doing things, building things, but also try to change behavior of people, try to change land use, and use different policy instruments for that. For example, legal uh, instruments, but also financial instruments or voluntary instruments can work quite well. And for Denmark, just like the, uh, the Netherlands, we need uh, to comply with all kinds of European Union requirements, uh, especially when it comes to nature conservation, but also when it comes to water legislation. Uh, and what we have seen, at least in the Netherlands, is that we always try to find uh, solutions by our famous polar model, model that we keep talking with all stakeholders and, and preferable choose for voluntary measures. But what we see is that if you have legal obligations, it's also a strong trigger for action. Then you really have to take action and do something. Uh, there are also coming some general requirements from, from the legal field, and that is mainly focusing on access to information, all kinds of requirements for public participation, and in the end, access to justice. Um, we, we had a time when uh, governments thought that these kind of requirements were more uh, a burden. It takes time and citizens could be seen as a problem that you have to solve. Oh yeah, we have these citizens too and they also want things. But there is a shift going on that, that participation and especially active participation, doing things together with the people in a certain urban area or agriculture area that's the same uh, has the same benefits can also brings a lot of good and it's not only a problem when citizens are involved on the contrary they can bring a lot of well new information to the floor if we have a specific focus on the dutch uh, scene then you can see here the very very small red dot that's us <laughs> Uh, and uh, we are really used floods for centuries. It is uh, more or less our reason of existence. We gained land from the sea. Um, large lakes have been turned into uh, 
into agriculture land. Um, and and well, we are used to live with water, but things are changing. If you look at the population density, can you see, uh, can you see my cursor uh, when I do this? Okay. Uh, this is the western part of the Netherlands, and as you see, most people are living over here. This is the area with flood-prone area. Uh, these are the flood-prone areas. And as you see, it's exactly the same location as where all people are living. And it's also where we earn our money. <clears throat> so... It's weird to see, and on, on the other hand, it's quite logical, that two-thirds of the Dutch population lives in the most vulnerable part of the country. It's over 60%, which is flood prone. And if you look at the dark blue parts over here, if we would not protect these areas, there would be a water level between one and six or seven meter high. So that is really serious. And at the same moment, our soil is also going down because we have a lot of peatland, which increases the risks. And if you look at our state and you see we are a constitutional monarchy, decentralized with a strong role for provinces and municipalities. If I'm right, and Denmark deleted the provinces, uh, as I remember. What is also very uh, typical for the Netherlands is that at the same level as the municipalities, we have water authorities who take care of the regional uh, water system. They take care of floods, water quality, uh, well, everything that has to do with water management is at a decentralized level. And as I said, we try to find consensus all the time. We have a strong planning culture, a civil law system, and different boards where people can go to. If you look at these specific water authorities, then you see that the state is taking care of the major rivers and the coast. But almost all waters are managed by these local authorities. And they have three main tasks. They should prevent floods. They should prevent uh, water shortages. They should protect the quality of water. And they should take care that water can fulfill its societal functions, like provide drinking water, uh, enable shipping, there should be water for agriculture, there should be water for cooling water for the industry, all that kind of recreation, swimming, that is main part of their task. Well, if we look at the types of flooding, I can be very sure of it. We have them all, except for water coming from mountains, as we are a completely flat country. And we also have hardly any dams, like uh, hydropower dams, which could break. Uh, the normal types of flooding are all, all there. And... I think what is really typical for the Netherlands is that we have legally binding safety standards for floods. And uh, we did a large EU project comparing different countries in the European Union. And I think we are the only one who have these legal safety standards for floods. And it's based on a risk approach, uh, like the probability uh, and the consequences, they form together the flood risk. And we have a system of adaptive planning and monitoring. And then we have two kind of well, policies. Um, the first one is a very active one. Uh, it's all the tasks that are performed by the water authorities. They build the dikes, they build sluices, they widen rivers, um, 
all that kind of issues that needs also powers to do that. If you want to build a dike on private property, you need instruments to be allowed to do that. You cannot just take private land from someone. So that's one part. It's the people working on the ground. And we have more preventive instruments like that you need a license or a permit if you want to build something in a flood prone area. And uh, what really helps is that these uh, decentralized water authorities, they have uh, the power to have their own regulations and they also can raise their own taxes. So they are financially almost independent from the state and the municipalities. Every action that is needed in the field of water management is paid by their own uh, tax incomes. And that makes them a very, very strong power in the state. And that's also why, for example, municipalities love them a lot. Everyone wants to cooperate with them because they have money. And that is different uh, when you look at the municipalities. It's also, uh, it's, it's not always positive because Everyone in the Netherlands also expect that these water authorities solve all our problems and finance them. So there is not much room for private responsibility. Um, so it's, it's good and it has its disadvantages. And what is also very strongly developed is the duty to compensate damage by the government. So once we, the, the water authorities are taking measures to make the country more safe, and they have to use private land or the land can not be used as intensive anymore as it was, then we have a legal uh, provision that says that if one is, is, is having much more damage than others, more than what you could expect in a normal society, then the government has to compensate that damage. And you can imagine it works as a sort of what we call creep oil. Uh, you have a very small country with a lot of societal functions, with a lot of people, so if you need land, and there is hardly any land available, then it helps a lot if there is money to satisfy people a bit. So it is a complex system. Uh, we have flood risk policies. Um, and because the country is so small and space is needed, there is an very intense relationship with spatial planning. And that is done by the municipalities. So they have to work together and they are not really used to that. But our, since a few years, we have a, what we call a water test. It's, uh, it means that, that uh, spatial planners and, and, and builders need to take the effects of the water system into account in, when they make spatial plans or land use plans for urban areas. If we are going to build here, what will be the consequences for, for example, flooding? And there are all kinds of legal procedures to, to, to fix that coordination. But um, one of the main questions is, of course, if you talk about urban areas, is who is going to pay the compensation? Is that the municipality, because it is part of urban planning? Or is it the water authority, because it's part of water management? And to avoid that private actors have to deal with this difficult question, our Water Act says, well, if it's related to water management, 
then the water manager will pay. Because before, it caused a kind of, well, delay in taking action. Because everyone was afraid that you had to pay for it. And if their measures are really necessary, then you should solve that problem beforehand. Don't talk about the money. We first have to take action to make it safe. But that is, of course, different in every country, depending on the risks that are at stake. Well, what we have been doing is, for example, um, lots of dike improvements, enforcements that they need uh, room. But we also worked on giving more room to watercourses and rivers. And this is just, well, some pictures on how you can do that. And the picture on the right is a, an area near the city, Dordrecht. It's a very vulnerable city. As you can see, it's completely surrounded by large rivers. So once there is a flood, the city is, well, really at risk. So what we did was making a whole new area where water can be stored in case of high water levels in the river, be able to protect the city. Um, of course, the people living in this area didn't want to leave and participation uh, resulted in a kind of special solution. They could stay there and their houses were lifted up. Uh, so they're living on the turf, as we call that. Um, and they know there will be a lot of floods sometimes, but they are still safe. And they choose that solution because they didn't want to move. Another one is um, also in the, in the more um, rural landscape to take care that river, if you see this one, this, this is a part where water will be in case of high water levels. So no, this, this is a normal situation. But once we have a flood, water can be stored in this additional new built branch of the river. And the very urban solution is also a new uh, development is this is uh, the past this is how we did it in the past this is an urban area and we protected it by building a dike around it so this is fully in the field of water management <clears throat> what we are now doing is looking can we also take actions in the field of spatial planning for example if we develop areas should we develop them and take care that, for example, vulnerable um, buildings like hospitals and schools are built a little bit higher? So in case of a flood, they're still safe. And then the third layer is how do we prepare if something goes wrong? Are all evacuation plans up to date and can people get out that area? in case something goes wrong. So we call that concept multi-layer safety. First one is traditional flood defense, then how we use urban planning. And the third one is what if things go wrong and people get out of that area. So we made a comparison in the EU project and there, there were five strategies. The first one is prevention, keep people away from the water. It's only possible if you have a lot of room. The second one is protection, like building dikes. The third one is preparedness. Tell people about the flood risks and what they can do in case of a flood. Then it's emergency response. So is that, are all plans there in case of a flood? And then the one that is very, much not developed in the Netherlands, and that is how do you recover after a flood? And that is because we didn't have any severe floods since 1953. And the idea is this is not going to happen again. 
which is a bit short-sighted because risks can always occur. So it's also a bit stupid not to think about that. So the risk prevention, the defense, and the mitigation, this is very relevant for the urban areas. It's urban green infrastructure, it's retention areas, it's urban water management, and the preparation, like warning systems and disaster planning, and the phase after a flood. And then it is important to realize that we don't work with the insurance system. Our regional water authorities are more or less our insurance system. They take care, it's not going to happen. So if you look at the measures, then for the urban areas, this should be the most interesting part. How can you prepare your urban areas to the effects of climate change? This is what you need maybe outside the urban area. Should it be surrounded by a dike? Should you need storm surge barriers? Uh, Depending on, 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 on the strategy, one should choose its policy instruments. If you look at Netherlands, then you see that we focus fully on defense works. We are building the dikes. We are technically very strong. That means that we are very lagging behind in the other strategies. That is something that is really context specific. And you cannot say, well, the Dutch are very good in flood defense, so we are going to do that in the same way, because it won't work. You really need to choose something that fits in the local context. For example, we compared it with England, and they say, well, now we are doing much more better. We have a lot of floods, so our population knows what to do in case of a flood. Your population will be completely paralyzed because they are not used to it. And they work with private insurances and they don't want too much involvement of the state. So if that's the culture in your country, then that should you should take the measures that fit in that culture. But for the Dutch one, the flood defense is a well, workable one. And you see that also, if you look at policy fields, you see that water system management is extremely well developed, large. Emergency management, okay. Urban management, water management, okay. But the role of spatial planning and flood defense is very small. And then you have some acts, it's all in the Water Act and the Spatial Planning Act. That's, and, and then we see a paradox. And uh, the OECD pointed uh, this on this. Uh, we have a kind of safety paradox because spatial planning and the role of municipalities is a general part of, of, of governmental policies. And they decide how land use will look like and water is following. If you want houses in that area, then the water authority should take care that people living in these houses are safe. But you can imagine that if you have uh, agriculture land, it's not so vulnerable for flooding than when people are living there. So it's strange that the municipalities decide what is going to happen in a certain area, and the water manager is following. He just has to provide the necessary safety level. And that is where the OECD pointed that this is not a very good system. And after the severe floods of 1953, uh, insurance companies said that the Netherlands is so vulnerable for floods that uh, insurance is not possible. It's called a low prob probability, but if it's happening, the impact is so high that nobody can pay for it. That is also the reason why we focus on prevention. 
And then we looked in that project at three specific urban areas. Uh, it will not sound familiar to you, but the Zuidplas polder, the first one, is it's the, the deepest point in the Netherlands. It's about seven to nine meters below sea level. Um, and one of the questions was, why are we still building urban areas in these places? Why do we choose that? And how do we solve it? How do we deal with the risks? And how is the interaction between spatial planning and flood risk management? And in that case, it's important to realize that uh, we need a lot of new houses in the western part of the country. Um, and if you are um, a politician in a municipality, the larger the municipality, the more important you are and the more money you get. So there is a kind of incentive to build more houses, even in vulnerable areas. And that was, was, was what ha was, was happening there. Just like our airport, Schiphol. It's in an extremely vulnerable area. But because Schiphol is there, a lot of companies want to be based there. Because it's interesting to be near a large uh, airport. So everybody is still moving to the most vulnerable part of the country. And um, well, that, that kind of really case studies we have been researching. And one of the largest conclusions was that, sorry, for example, so EU policies like the EU floods directive didn't have much impact in the Netherlands because we already had a well-developed flood risk uh, system. The fact that we have safety norms included in our law give citizens the feeling that they are safe and that there is a legal obligation for the government to take care of them. It also means that it's very difficult to change because why should people change that? Why should you choose to take your own private measures to be more safe? Why should you move to a more safe place? If we have this legal obligation for the government to take care of you. And then the whole country is full of flood defense works. And these large investments in the past that lead to past dependency. Then we keep it this way. It's, it's very difficult to take new approaches. So <clears throat> we looked at how future proof are we? And what are strengths and weaknesses of the Dutch systems? And what are examples of good practice? And then we see that we invest a lot of knowledge building, long-term development knowledge building. And we see an increased cooperation between spatial plannings, architects, lawyers, water managers. And the strength is our highly institutionalized water system management with the safety norms, more than enough policy instruments, very specialized water authorities. But our main problem is that nobody in the Netherlands knows that we are this vulnerable. Nobody thinks about it. Sometimes when there are immigrants in the Netherlands, they think, oh, is this safe over here? But there won't be a Dutch person who will think about, are we safe in this country? It's not within our view. And that is also a risk. You need to pay for it. You need to be willing to pay taxes to stay safe. If you look at this picture, you see the coastline, the, the light blue areas. That would be the coastline of the Netherlands if we have one meter sea level rise. All the dark parts will be disappeared. So there is a serious 
challenge for the future. How are we going to deal with this? Because one meter sea level rise is not that much. I mean, there are scenarios, scenarios who are much worse. So we are thinking about what can we do? Build, we build more of these very fancy, great defense works. Should we work with double dikes? We do this in nature conservation areas. Should we build with nature, try to expand towards the sea? That's also some pilot projects. Or should we just give rivers more room like this? So in case of uh, higher water levels in rivers or sea level rise, we find new solutions to deal with this. And we also think about the longer future. And that is, how do we want to cope with what is ahead of us? Are we closing everything? Are we built more towards the sea? Are we give up our country and move to the east, to Germany? Which is a serious one if you saw the previous picture. Uh, so we have to decide what is what do we want and how can we get there? And this needs a societal discussion, I'm afraid. You can't give up your country because most of the people live there. 60% of the Dutch population lives there. So we must do something, but we are not sure what would be the best way. So time for discussion, I hope. Uh, we have some lessons learned, uh, for example, that you should broaden the discussion, not only look at climate change, but also on soil subsidence, for example, that you need a very explicit societal debate about these questions, that you could focus on opportunities, that you should take care that you not only focus on economic approaches, that you should be aware that you need funding and who is going to pay for it. And <clears throat> furthermore, what was a lesson from the project was that it is very important to enable local solutions because every part of the country is different. That you should try to mainstream these flood risk policies in other policy domains like uh, social security, uh, spatial planning, nature conservation, when you look at nature-based solutions. And that you should take care of distributional effects, because in this time there will always be people who win and there will be people who lose. And if you want societal support for these kind of issues, you should not forget that it should be fair in the end. <clears throat> 